Hi, this is Tim Weber from South Texas College coming to you with an introduction to the introduction of psychology. And so uh, let's go right to an outline and get that up there for you. Here we go. And let's make sure I have something to uh, point to anything with. Okay, that should do it. Okay. All right, so notice that in your textbook, the first chapter is called Thinking Critically with Psychological Science, which seems like an odd name for the first chapter. Why not introduction? But notice that they're trying to make a very important point, which I agree with. Um, notice thinking critically. So uh, one of the things they're trying to impress upon us is that critical thinking is going to be an important part of the process in psychology. And as a student of psychology, you also need to engage in your own critical thinking as you examine various ideas. Uh, notice also psychological science. So to emphasize that today, psychology is primarily the scientific study of, of behavior and mental processes, as we'll see in a moment. So when we look at psychology, we're going to find that it is defined as the study of behavior or mental processes. And so when we talk about behavior, that would be any action that can be observed in any way. Uh, mental processes then would be processes which we know exist yet uh, cannot be directly observed. Things like what? Uh, thinking, uh, perception, memory, uh, consciousness itself, and so on. So Notice that this would involve the study of ourselves, study of other humans, as well as study of animals. So there are four potential goals that the psychologist may have in studying these things. One might be simply to describe them, to describe what behaviors occur under certain circumstances, or to describe the uh, mental processes, for example, the types of memory to describe them. Uh, another goal that the psychologist might have would be to explain behaviors or mental processes. Why do people do a certain thing at a certain, under certain circumstances? Um, why uh, do certain mental processes occur uh, as they do? Uh, thirdly, a goal might be to predict these behaviors or mental processes. That could be very important. For example, predicting how people might uh, respond in a catastrophe such that maybe we can take steps to save lives. Or predicting uh, what is going to occur in terms of mental processes and how people perceive things, for example. A fourth goal might be to change or control behaviors or mental processes. So uh, for example, we might study how can people break bad habits? How can people get into new and better habits? Uh, how can we improve the way that we think or the way that we um, perceive the world? So uh, some basics in terms of uh, goals that psychologists have. And so, you know, when it comes to then satisfying curiosity about behavior and mental processes, now some people will go to, say, uh, radio uh, talk counselors, a talk show, um, as an old one that used to be, or maybe they'll go to a psychic to try to learn about themselves or others, but you have to admit that the information that you get from these sources uh, can be uh, questionable or simply inaccurate in some cases. And so how do we then uh, find a way to get at some of these questions in a way that's less likely to produce uh, error and inaccuracies? And so we're going to study how we moved from simply speculating about behavior and mental processes 
to the actual then psychological science that we have today. So often psychologists trace the roots of this discipline back to Aristotle, fourth century BCE, and in the sense that he was trying to answer many of these same questions. Uh, his method, though, was simply to make personal observations and then make guesses and then speculate as to why things that he observed happened. He didn't have the scientific methodology that was developed uh, since that time. And so, interestingly, some of his observations and speculations were pretty good and later were confirmed by science. Uh, for example, he suggested that we learn by associating something we already know with something new, and turns out that scientific investigation of learning found exactly that. On the other hand, some of his ideas uh, we might laugh at today, like his idea that emotions occur because gas builds up around our heart inside of our body, and therefore we experience the, uh, the emotion. Uh, we'd probably think that's pretty laughable today, but realize he didn't have the scientific methodology to investigate that that we do. Now, fast forward <laughs> about 2,000 years, and we have in the meantime the development of various psycho scientific methodologies. So scientific methods that enabled us to study uh, biology, living things, uh, chemistry, the actions of various substances, um, physics, the uh, actions of objects. And um, so we, in the methods that were developed, um, were not yet used to study behavior and mental processes. So late 1800s, along comes this guy, Wilhelm Wundt, Leipzig, Germany. And he suggests, hey, why don't we study people's behavior, mental processes, using the scientific methodology that was so successful in helping us to understand how many of the things in the universe work. And so he then began to make carefully measured observations about certain behaviors, conduct experiments, and so we usually think of Wundt as the father of scientific psychology. As an example of the type of uh, things that Wundt did, uh, in 1879, he conducted the experiment. He had people push a button when they heard a ball hit a platform, and he found it took about one-tenth of a second for them to respond to that activity. Then the people were instructed to push the button when they had become consciously aware that they had heard the ball hitting the platform. Under those instructions, it took people twice as long, two tenths of a second to respond. So notice he is using uh, direct measurements and observations to investigate something here, how long responses take. Now, today we would say, well, he's investigating reaction time. And what did he find? Tw takes twice as long when you are observing your own uh, sensory input. And so when you are using uh, consciously responding to something, that takes longer than when you're making uh, an automatic, automatic response. And some of you may know that if you study martial arts, you might find that, yes, when you can um, do a particular technique automatically, you can do that much more rapidly than if you have to think about each step of it. So it goes back to Wundt. Now, following Wundt, Wundt had numerous students, some of whom were champions of the idea of structuralism. So structuralism in psychology means that what they were trying to do is to build sort of a model of the structure of the mind. 
So to try to diagram, if you will, how various parts of the mind work together. Now, one of the commonly used techniques in early psychology was that of introspection. You can probably kind of guess what that might mean, even if it's a new word to you. Notice you have spection as part of it. That sounds a lot like what? Spectator? <laughs> what do spectators do? Well, they watch something very closely, right? Um, or you might, what about inspection? Oh yeah, when you inspect something, you look at it very carefully, right? And so introspection would be then the person paying attention to inner sort of processes and very closely watching, observing those inner experiences and then reporting upon them, okay? So for example, the child here reporting upon their experience of the flower and trying to describe it. What's it like to experience that flower? What's that smell like and so on? Notice that introspection has some limitations. Uh, for one thing, uh, we're not directly measuring anything, and so we're only relying on what people can report to us. Um, the reports are subjective. In other words, people may experience things differently. Um, and so this may give a sense of what people uh, can experience, but it doesn't give us a good way to measure what's universal. Functionalism was another movement in psychology, and this was especially uh, promoted by William James. William James was uh, one of the first major psychologists in the U.S., usually thought of as the father of American psychology. And he became interested in how our human style of thinking and behavior enabled our ancestors to live long enough to reproduce. He was uh, influenced by many of the ideas of uh, the evolutionary theory uh, that said traits existed because they helped their ancestors survive. So for example, when it comes to memory, James might ask the question, well, how did memory help our ancestors survive? Oh, well, maybe it might help them survive uh, through uh, remembering Oh, yeah, uh, that cave over there, yeah, that's full of uh, eh, uh, dangerous spiders. If you go there, you might not live long enough to reproduce. And that other cave there, oh, I think there might be some interesting individuals of the other sex there. And who knows, maybe you might have the opportunity to reproduce and pass your genes along. So that was kind of the idea of functionalism, looking at everything from what is the function for our survival. William James was also important because he mentored another pioneer in psychology here in the U.S., and that was Mary Calkins. Now, Mary Calkins was one of William James's students, James's students, at Harvard University, and in fact scored highest on doctoral exams, and should have been awarded a doctoral degree by Harvard. Harvard refused to do so. Why did they not give her the degree she deserved? Well, because she was a woman. And in the, uh, those times, the late 1800s, doctoral degrees were not awarded to women. There was significant discrimination. Now, some of that has changed. In fact, uh, Mary Calkins made major contribute, contributions to psychology. She did memory research, developed something called the paired associates test that we still use in memory research today. She became the first female president of the APA in what was the year, 1904 or 1907, I always forget, but very early in the 1900s. That's even way before women could vote in elections here in the U.S. So we like to think that psychology has been in the forefront of equality and equal opportunities of any institution here in the United States, and we hope to continue to be so, offering everybody 
equal opportunity to participate. Okay, so let's look at another uh, trend in the development of psychology. This also in the late 1800s and early 1900s, that of Freudian or psychoanalytic psychology. So Sigmund Freud was a medical doctor and he had many patients who came to him with various complaints that seemed to have no real physical cause. So he eventually um, theorized that their problems were created by psychological phenomena and particularly uh, were caused by unconscious conflicts, unconscious um, uh, fears and so forth uh, that were then undermining their health as well as their behavior and personality. So psychoanalysis or the psychodynamic theory, as we'll be hear it called later, really highlighted the potential of the unconscious mind and its ability to influence us. Now, basically, you had the uh, previous uh, ideas in psychology as your choices up until the 1920s. At this point, things changed as the behaviorists came along. These psychologists suggested that in order to be a true science, the psychologist should only study and experiment with things that could be directly observed and directly measured. And so the idea of studying the unconscious which you cannot directly measure, uh, was outside of their uh, picture of things. Now, the behaviorists did many experiments that did give us very useful information. Uh, for example, John Watson uh, studied uh, the um, emotional responses of individuals and found that fear could be a learned response, a conditioned response, or something that ended up being called uh, classical conditioning, and demonstrated that uh, fear could be a learned uh, advice in his um, famous little Albert experiment that you'll learn about later. You also had another major behaviorist who came along, B.F. Skinner, and he studied the way consequences of our behavior shape us. So how, what happens when we do something uh, then encourages us to repeat that action or to avoid it in the future. And so this study of operant conditioning also uh, gave us greater understanding of how people learn. In fact, what you'll find is sometimes behaviorism is referred to as learning theory. You might want to just note that down, learning theory. Now, these behaviorists then saw little value in introspection of people reporting on what was going on inwardly. They said you really couldn't know what was going on inside. Uh, the person was like a black box if you couldn't see what was going on inside. Uh, so they basically rejected the ideas of psychoanalysis and introspection. The behaviorists also became the most prominent uh, group amongst psychologists from uh, around 1920 till the 1960s. So for a sizable amount of time, you might say psychology kind of lost its mind because they said you can't study the mind, only behavior. Around uh, 1960s, maybe like in the late 1950s, though, the humanist idea uh, began to take hold in psychology. And so people like Abram Maslow and Carl Rogers looked at what psychology we had been doing, studying only behaviors, and primarily looking at people who were having problems and said, well, let's study 
people who are thriving and see what it is that could enable people to develop their full potential. And so as they did this, they developed theories and treatments to help people feel uh, more accepted, reach their full potential, and they emphasized basic human needs that they identified through studying people. Now, this then should give you the picture that the definition of psychology has changed over time. Now, if you would have asked Wilhelm Wundt, Edward Titchener, in the earliest days, they would say, well, it's the science of mental life. If we then ask the behaviorists later on, like Watson and Skinner, they'd say, well, it's the scientific study of observable behavior quite different. As the cognitive psychologists came in in the 1960s, oops, better take a moment to explain that. So cognitive psychology was then the study of how we process information. So how do we take the information we get from our eyes and ears and interpret that information? Uh, how do we make sense of that sensory information? How do we store that information and retrieve it through memory? How do we make decisions based on that information? How do we sometimes make errors in how we analyze that information and so on? So whenever you see cognitive, think about information processing, information processing. So cognitive psychologists came along in the 1960s and they were able to study internal mental processes uh, regarding how we processed information. So that brought the study of mental processes back into psychology after it was kind of drummed out by the behaviorists. And this was also helped by the neuroscience, uh, cognitive neuroscience, for example. So cognitive neuroscience would try to understand how our nervous system and brain, that's neuroscience, how it was involved with the process of the information. How does our brain process this stuff? Uh, how does our brain make sense of information that it receives and so on? Uh, how does damage maybe to the brain impair our ability, our cognitive ability, so forth? So, but that brought back the whole idea of mental processes uh, back into psychology. So as we look at it today, now we define psychology as both science of behavior as well as mental processes. One of the biggest concerns within psychology then is also understanding the interactions between nature and nurture when it comes to behavior and mental processes. So are our behavioral and mental traits, are they already set at conception when we, uh, when we inherit our genetic nature from our parents? Or are these behavioral and uh, mental traits a response to our environment, our experience? Are they a matter of how we've learned to cope with things. So that's been a question for a long time. What psychologists have found is it's not a matter of is it nature or is it nurture, but rather how do these two interact to influence us? Okay, so notice that in fact all humans share a common origin that gives us an inborn human nature because we share that set of genes with one another. We're going to have great similarities with one another. So nature plays a part. But we also then have differences that are shaped by our environment. So that's the simple way to look at it. It's not one or the other, but one interacting with the other. So here's a good statement. Nurture works on what nature endows. So our genetic makeup that we've inherited gives us certain potentials. 
certain uh, potential capabilities as well as maybe some limitations. And then what we experience through our life, the conditions, experience, then work on those natural endowments in order to influence just how we turn out. So biology plus environment leads us to then the biopsychosocial levels of analysis. So almost all psychologists today take the biopsychosocial viewpoint. You say, wow, that's a big long word, but we can break it down. What's it saying? It's saying that biology is one influence on how we are. So are psychological factors. And then thirdly, social factors all come into play. So biology, for example, and the genes that we've inherited, how our brain is structured, including how did our specific brain develop, um, our brain chemistry, as well as survival needs, what our genes provide us uh, in terms of basic uh, behaviors and processes for survival, reflexes, biological thing that's built in, as well as sensation, the ability to detect various stimuli in our environment through our eyes, ears, touch, so on and so forth. These interact with social influences. So the influence of culture, education, relationships, interactions with other people, and thirdly, these all interact with psychological factors. So the thoughts that we have, the emotions we're experiencing, the moods that we are in at any particular time, the choices that we make, the behaviors we engage in, the psychological traits that we have, such as personality traits, um, the motivations that we might be working from, the knowledge that we have, and the perceptions that we have as we interpret the various sensations that uh, we encounter. So in order to really understand what's going on psychologically, we have to take into account that any or all of these might be involved. And for example, let's have a look at, say, whoops, <laughs> intelligence or depression or enjoying soccer or shyness, any of these, there may be biological influences, like the natural selection for adaptive traits of certain natural tendencies we're gonna have that helped our ancestors to survive, as well as genetic predispositions to respond to our environment. So our set of genes, uh, do we react, for example, very strongly to our environment or not so strongly? Um, brain mechanisms. So, um, for example, what are the levels of various neurotransmitters, chemicals in our brain? Um, hormonal influences uh, as well. On all of these uh, sorts of things, we have to take into account potential psychological influences. So, for example, learned fears or other expectations that we have learned from experience or emotional responses that are occurring, as well as cognitive processing. How are we processing the information we have? How are we interpreting the information that we have about the world? And then thirdly, cultural factors and social factors, for example, um, the presence of others and how that presence might affect us, as well as what our culture, society, or family expects from us. Um, what uh, various peers, others like us, friends and so forth, uh, might have the influence of, of groups that we are a part of and how various models that we might encounter, such as what we see in the media, might have as an influence. So we have to take all these things into account whenever we look at any of these psychological phenomena. Now, we're next gonna look at a number of perspectives in psychology. And 
as you do this, you may uh, start to wonder, gosh, why do we have to have all these different perspectives? Why can't we just have one simple way to look at things? Well, we might highlight the, um, the story of the blind men and the elephant. So several blind men uh, back in India centuries ago encountered an elephant. Of course, they couldn't see it, but they sure could feel it. And so each one of them, though, described the elephant differently. One ran into the legs and said, oh, the elephant is like a tree. Next ran into the tail and said, ah, no, the elephant is like a rope. Another ran into the trunk and said, oh, no, the elephant is like a snake. Another, the tusk, and said the elephant is like a spear. And one ran into the side of the elephant and said the elephant's like a wall. Another, the ear, and said it's like a fan. Now, who was right? In fact, all of them were right. But each of them had only a partial picture of what an elephant is. Each of them had a different perspective that if we put it all together, we then get a better picture of what an elephant is than if we look at things from only one perspective. So why do we need numerous perspectives? Because as we piece them together, we get a better understanding of the whole person. So here we go. Various perspectives. First of all, today we have the cognitive perspective. Cognitive perspective, again, is going to look at how we, how we process information. So the kind of questions we'd be asking if we're thinking from that perspective is things like, well, how reliable is memory? How can we improve our, our thinking? Uh, how can we better understand how things really are and so forth? There is also then the social cultural perspective. So that's going to look at various phenomena and say, could these behavior skills attitudes, could these be downloads from our culture? Uh, or to what extent might they be? And then we have behavioral genetics. So this one takes a little explanation. Behavior genetics is involved with looking at various genetic traits, various genes, and trying to understand how these influence uh, behavior. Okay, so trying to trace various psychological traits to specific genetic patterns. So this might look at those same behavior skills attitudes and say, well, how could these maybe be due to that person's personal genetic heritage? So looking at how specific genes uh, relate to specific traits. Neuroscience perspective today. So this is going to be looking at how the workings of the brain and nervous system are involved with our behaviors and their processes. So what role does our brain play with emotions? Uh, what nervous system mechanisms might influence how we feel pain? Can we trust the information from, we're getting from our senses and so on? Today, we also have the psychodynamic perspective. Psychodynamic perspective grew out of that psychoanalytic perspective that Freud first started, which highlighted the importance of unconscious processing of information. So the psychodynamic perspective today might try to answer questions like, uh, do inner childhood conflicts uh, maybe still trouble me today or maybe create me some difficulties, even though I don't remember the events of that early childhood or do forgotten events from my past affect my behavior now? Uh, for that matter, psychodynamic viewpoint might be looking at things like, am I actually being influenced by unconscious attitudes about race or other things that I'm not even aware of? Then we have the behaviors viewpoint. So yes, behaviorists, uh, again, looking at how we learned and how various behaviors are reinforced. So investigating 
how our problem behavior is maintained through a process of reinforcement. How does conditioning potentially lead to fears, or how can we use conditioning maybe to help people rid themselves of uh, fears uh, or change their behaviors? And then we have also today the evolutionary perspective. So that's looking at how various psychological traits and various behaviors might have helped our ancestors survive. So today looking at um, things that might not make sense from any other perspective, like why are people prone to say panic or anger making irrational judgments, things that might not make sense on the other hand, if we look at maybe the conditions our ancestors uh, uh, had, uh, in some ways those might have been advantageous under their circumstances, although maybe not now. So uh, we'll say one thing of all of the perspectives here, I think probably the evolutionary perspective is the most guesswork <laughs> of all of them because there's uh, we can't directly test this although much of the others we can directly test nonetheless sometimes it does give us some interesting answers about why people might do something that otherwise doesn't make sense today okay so let's play what's my perspective take a moment and have a look at each of these explanations about obsessive compulsive disorder and try to decide which of those perspectives that I just recounted for you uh, would apply to each one, okay, which would exemplify each of those uh, types of perspectives, okay. Now, before we do that, I guess I should explain to you what is obsessive compulsive disorder. Maybe some of you've heard it, but that people aren't quite clear what it's about. So obsessive compulsive disorder, this is a disorder of uh, behavior and emotion uh, in which the person has certain obsessions. These are mental things. Uh, it could be a fear, uh, a mental image or urge that is distressful uh, to them and that they'd rather not have, but yet it keeps coming back, uh, it keeps persisting. And so coupled with that obsession, there is a compulsion. Compulsion is a behavior. Uh, it is a behavior the person feels they must perform. It often briefly relieves that obsessive thought or feeling, but uh, before long, the compulsion must be repeated in order to uh, keep the anxiety of that obsessive thought or image whatever it is down so that's what that's all about okay so now take a moment stop the video look at each one of these note down which of the perspectives you think should fit with it and then when you come back i'll walk you through each of them okay all right did you stop the video and did you do that yeah come on you didn't did you you did? Oh, cool. Okay. All right. So here we go. The orange one says obsessive compulsive disorder is a problem in the orbital cortex. Notice there, um, well, orbital cortex is a brain structure. Maybe we should have told you that. This seems to be consistent with neuroscience perspective and tracing this problem to something going on in the person's brain. Let's go to the one in the black box here. Compulsions start as habits rewarded by anxiety relief. Okay, habits um, rewarded, behavior being reinforced by producing anxiety relief. Ah, this is behaviorism, something that is learned. A habit is something you learn, right? And then something rewarding that keeps it going is behaviorism. Let's go over to this box here, the blue box. No, ECD is an inherited condition. Well, this points to behavior genetics, certain genes predisposing people to have that disorder. Or how about this one? OCD comes from a natural instinct to control the environment. 
ah, this might be something natural instinct is something we inherited from our ancestors, right? So that seems to fit with the evolutionary perspective. And then over here in the purple box, no, a sign of unresolved childhood issues. Oh, how about the psychodynamic view? Things from our childhood unresolved might plague us later. Going down to this turquoise box. No, OCD is a matter of mental habits and mental errors that can be corrected. Ah, does that sound like the cognitive approach? Uh-huh, how we're processing information mentally, what habits we have in processing that information or errors in processing it. And then the last one that you might have guessed is going to be a social cultural OCD thinking, reaction to fast paced out of control lifestyle. So our, our current culture, social situation. Okay, now let me ask you this. Of all of these explanations, which one is right? Well, if you answer potentially, they could all be correct. Uh, you get the prize because yes, uh, it is possible that all of these could be correct. And notice how in the, that case, all of the information from each perspective, what adds to our understanding of an obsessive compulsive disorder, gives us uh, another piece of the puzzle, if you will, about that disorder. Now, are they all correct? Well, we'd have to investigate them scientifically and find out. Nonetheless, they could all at the same, same time be correct, contributing to our understanding. So now we go to the subfields in psychology. So we've looked at perspectives and how people view things, viewpoints, if you will. These are the areas in which psychologists do their work. So you can sort of divide that up uh, into most basically either basic research or applied uh, disciplines of psychology. Basic research is simply done to better understand the, uh, the world and ourselves as humans as well as animals. So satisfies basic curiosity about how things work and also just, you know, kind of done to understand how things work, okay? Applied psychology is taking information we've learned through research and then applying it in various areas of life, as you'll see, okay? So um, there's two kind of basic sides of it. Uh, by the way, uh, imagine in your mind a psychologist, okay? Now, what did you imagine? Did you imagine someone um, maybe uh, having a conversation with someone, maybe taking some notes, uh, that sort of thing. Often people do because the first thing that comes to mind is a psychologist who is a psychotherapist. Um, and a good number of psychologists do that. But what you should also know is there is a huge number of psychologists that don't have anything to do with that, that simply engage in basic research. Now, where will you find these folks? Generally at, what, major universities and um, organizations of those sorts doing their research. In many cases, these researchers also teach courses at those institutions as well, but their primary function is actually to engage in research. Okay, so we have the biological psychologist that investigates the physical, biological influences on behavior. We also have developmental psychologists. So these psychologists study how people develop um, throughout the lifespan, from the time that they're conceived until the time that they die and how various psychological traits develop over time, both normally as well as maybe when development goes off course. 
cognitive psychologists, <laughs> you should know what they do. They're going to study how we process information, studying things like memory and perception and consciousness and uh, you know, decision making and motivation and all that kind of stuff. And then you have personality psychologists. So they then are studying, first of all, how can we best uh, divide up personality traits? How can we best um, characterize the personality traits of individuals? How can we best test for these? How can we apply these? How do these personality traits influence how people do in various situations and various uh, vocations and so on? So um, that's what they study. Social psychologists, they're going to study the influence of others on us and our influence on others. They're going to look at uh, relationships. They're going to look at the influence of groups. They're going to study things like um, racial equality as well as discrimination and how we can maybe uh, stop that kind of thing and improve the situation, people, and so on. Okay, so all of the things having to do with how people interact with one another. And then let's add to this list, positive psychology, branch of psychology, hasn't been around that long, that we're looking at, well, how can we help people thrive and do their best and reach their full potential in life and enjoy life and all that good stuff. Okay, now on the other column, apply areas of psychology, we have clinical psychology. So the clinical psychologist is trained to diagnose and treat psychological disorders. So they're going to be working with primarily people who have these disorders or potentially might. Um, we're also, the, they also primarily use psychotherapy as the treatment for psychological disorder. Counseling psychologists. These psychologists work with people who are encountering just everyday kind of problems. So helping people, for example, uh, make decisions about what should I major in? What vocation should I choose? How can I improve my relationship with someone? How can I overcome a relationship problem? How can I maybe continue to function well as a student even when I'm under many stresses at home and so forth, okay? So counseling psychologists working with people with everyday kinds of stuff. Educational psychologists. These uh, psychologists work within the educational system. So part of their work may involve identifying children who have special needs psychologically and developing programs for those children so that they can learn effectively. Uh, educational psychologists also may study educational methodology to try to determine how can we best help students learn, forth like that. And then we have industrial organizational psychologists. I'm just gonna call them IO psychologists because it's easy. So the IO psychologists you might never have heard of, these work with various businesses and organizations. So these psychologists then may help, um, for example, uh, a business in trying to determine which uh, applicants for a position are best suited for that work. They might be called upon to come into the workplace and help resolve um, relationship uh, issues between uh, management and employees. They might be asked to redesign the work environment in such a way that uh, employees can be productive yet less stressed when the day is over. Or they might be asked to even do things like determine what kinds of packaging would uh, encourage potential customers to buy products. <laughs> so when you go into HEB and you look in there, you say, I wonder who decides uh, what to put on the bottom shelf, top shelf, and what color to make the packaging and all of that. 
yeah, it's probably one of those IO psychologists who's behind the scenes doing the work on that kind of stuff. Okay, oh, by the way, I should mention on this, um, the previous psychologist, you generally have to have an advanced degree, at least a master's degree, if not a uh, PhD, a doctoral degree. In IO psychology, you may be able to get into that with a bachelor's degree uh, or a master's degree. And interestingly, it pays real well. So if you're interested in uh, vocations in psychology, but you don't really want to be a psych clinical psychologist or counselor and so forth, yeah, you might think about this one. It could be really interesting. Then we have community psychologists. So these psychologists then are involved, um, employed by various community groups in order to help influence the public in a positive way. So they might be called upon to come up with um, a campaign that will encourage people to throw their trash uh, away appropriately rather than littering the ground with everything. Uh, they might be involved with uh, trying to determine what is the best way we can encourage people in the community to protect their health. That's a big one uh, right now. We're in the midst of the uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And yeah, <laughs> Uh, we need the advice of those community psychologists. How can we best influence people to be safe and keep others safe as well? Um, then, oh, we have clinical psychology again. And you say, well, why is that on there twice? Uh, well, I had six spaces here and I have five things. Uh, my degree is in clinical psychology. I'm a little bit biased, so I said, I'll just stick that in there a second time. Okay. So let's go on. There are a number of psychology related professions that you should be aware of as well. Psychiatrists. Psychiatrists are physicians, they're medical doctors. Um, they however, have training in psychology as well as the diagnosis of psychological disorders. And they approach psychological disorders from a primarily physical perspective. Psychiatrists then are those that can prescribe medication for psychological difficulties. Note that clinical psychologists generally cannot prescribe medication with you exception of a couple of states that have programs for psychologists to prescribe uh, psychologists primarily treat psychological disorders with medications. So psychiatrists, medication, psychologists, no. We should also be aware that professionals in many other uh, fields use the uh, knowledge of psychology to help people. So people who are involved in social work, counseling, marriage and family therapists. Uh, all of these people may be trained to do psychotherapy with a specific group of people, again, calling on the knowledge of psychology to help others. Okay, so that ends this section. The next section will take up why do we need to use the scientific method to study psychology coming in the next episode.